How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are, we are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, you call us to be people of courage and hope, and yet we run and hide. You challenge us to proclaim our faith, but we huddle in darkness. Forgive us when we seem to be prodding over and over again. Change us. Transform us. Make us the disciples you call us to be as we continue to pray. In the name of Jesus, who led us into this life, we pray. Amen. 
Good morning, St. John's. I hope that all of you are taking care and staying connected as best that you can. I hope that you've had a chance to receive your vaccines. If you need some assistance figuring out how to get vaccinated, we have some resources that we can point you to. Just give us a call at the church office. If you're in the neighborhood and you would like to stop by for a socially distanced gathering, just come on by on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday during the day, and we are glad to see you come inside and see the progress that's being made on the sanctuary. You can take a moment and pray in the chapel or go and visit the St. John's Garden. Every day that garden has something to share. There's also opportunities to serve in the soup kitchen on sun Saturday afternoons. That team is looking for volunteers to help them socially distanced serve others in the soup kitchen. If you're interested in attending some safely uh, socially distanced in-person study groups, there is the Tuesday morning Bible study that will have a hybrid meeting. They will continue meeting online and also in person in the room outside the chapel and there are plenty of recovery meetings happening hybrid safely in person and online in the White House. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for St. John's. God, we thank you for all that is going right in the world and we lift to you all that needs your help and your touch. God, we ask you to help us to be a healing community for all of our neighbors, for our city, and for our world. Guide us each day as we try to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay safe, everyone. So far in this Easter season, we have read Mark's story or non-story of the resurrection and we've also heard John's story of the resurrection and today we are hearing Luke's version. The disciples and their companions are gathered in the upper room discussing Jesus' appearance to Peter when the risen Christ shows up. We're reading from the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel beginning with verse 36. Will you listen with me for God's word to us today? While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. So he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. May God's richest blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of this word. Will you pray with me and for me? And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of us be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there was this group of fifth and sixth graders taking a science test. And here are some of their answers. One student described the law of gravity as saying, no fair jumping up without coming back down. 
Pretty good, huh? A couple of the kids responded to questions about clouds, and one said, I'm not sure how clouds are formed, but clouds know how to do it, and that's the important thing. Okay. <laughs> Another one said, water vapor gets together in a cloud, and when it's big enough to be called a drop, it does. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, just a couple more. One youngster said, you can listen to thunder and tell how close you came to getting hit. If you don't hear it, you got hit, so never mind. <laughs> True enough. And one child defined the spinal column as a long bunch of bones. The head sits on the top and you sit on the bottom. Okay, in my book. And I have to say, when I first ran across this list of test questions and answers, I read through it with, with some degree of anticipation because I was hoping that one of the students, well, at least one of them, would attempt to explain the resurrection for us. I mean, the concept has confounded the church for years and their answers were so creative, I thought for sure one of them might have tackled the issue. But it was not to be. On the other hand, the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke can't seem to get enough of the resurrection. In the course of 46 verses, rather 49 verses, three resurrection stories are told. First, it's the glorious account of Easter morning with the women at the tomb, and then the encounter of two friends with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and then the one we just heard a few minutes ago with the risen Christ appearing to a group of his followers where they were sitting around talking, no doubt about Jesus' death and the bizarre rumors that were circulating about his missing body. That's what they were doing when he appears in their midst out of seemingly nowhere. The scripture tells us they respond with terror, which I suspect any one of us would do if our deceased loved one suddenly showed up in our living rooms, which tells me that it's one thing to speculate about resurrection, quite another to experience it. And Jesus says to them, why are you startled? And why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, it's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. And then, as if to reassure them that he was no apparition, Jesus asks for something to eat and proceeds to eat a piece of broiled fish in front of them. Ghosts don't do that. Clearly, Jesus wants the disciples to know that this is not a hoax, not a hallucination, not a figment of their imagination. No, this is the living, breathing, touchable, hungry Jesus Christ whom God has raised from the dead. And no wonder they were taken aback. It was a hard message to believe. They had seen Jesus crucified. Some had stayed and heard his last breath. Others had taken him down from the cross and felt his cold, stiff body. They had laid him in the tomb and sealed it with a heavy stone. And now, with all of them still in shock over the whole thing, here he was before them, warm flesh and bone with a hungry belly, asking them for some supper. Quite naturally, they are blown away. Look, says Jesus, you aren't seeing a ghost. It really did happen. Go ahead, touch me. You'll see that I'm real. I'm the same person who walked with you and taught you, that cried and laughed with you, that scolded you and also affirmed you. The Word made flesh. Hard as it is, this is the gospel message. Jesus has been raised from the dead, is alive and wants his disciples to continue his work. Simply by expressing physical hunger and accepting bodily nourishment, Jesus turns trauma into communion. And by the end of the encounter, they are no longer frightened human beings. They are witnesses of these things, emboldened for life and ministry.
Now, I don't know what you believe about resurrection, but I do know that the Easter message can get lost in distracting debates about the details, about whether or not Jesus really returned to bodily life after he was crucified, or whether resurrection is a metaphor of enduring presence of Jesus, even though his body remained on the slab somewhere. In the early years of Christianity, a similar skepticism developed. The scholars tell us that when Luke wrote this gospel years after these events, some folks had come to believe that this Jesus thing was all spiritual, the resurrection all symbolic, that the important things were the memories that they had of him. But courageously, Luke countered such thinking. Whoa, wait a minute, he says. How about the time he showed up hungry? Remember when he asked, have you anything here to eat? Jesus' disciples may have been shocked and surprised, stunned and stupefied, but there was no denying it. Jesus was there, flesh and blood, eating fish. A lifetime of experience told them that death was the end, but standing right there in front of them, Jesus told them otherwise. Look at my hands and my feet, he insisted. And when they looked, they saw the truth in those hands. They saw the one who had turned water into wine, who had placed children on his lap and blessed them, had ground spit and dirt into a mud paste to heal a blind man, broke bread with his friends. With those hands, he lifted up a girl taken to be dead and set her on her feet so that she could walk. With those hands, he had touched the leper and embraced the outsider and welcomed the stranger without hesitation. When they looked, they saw the truth in those feet, which had carried him all the way from Galilee to Jericho to Jerusalem. Those were the feet that took him into the synagogue and the homes of tax collectors and sinners through the cities of privilege to the tombs of the garrison demoniac, from the wedding feast to the feast of Passover, and through the valley of the shadow of death. These were the feet anointed by the women who had wet them with her tears and dried them with her hair. They were the feet before which Mary sat as a disciple while her sister Martha fussed at her to get up and work. The hands and feet of Jesus. But the disciples, myopic as usual, cannot see him for who he is, not even after watching him eat supper, not even after recognizing those hands and those feet. So Jesus goes for plan B, saying, Do you remember how it was when we talked together about the scripture? And he begins again to tell the story of God's plan to restore all creation from the covenant of Abraham to the exodus from Egypt, from Ezekiel's valley of the dry bones to Isaiah's suffering servant. He told them all this before, of course, but this time it was different. He opened their minds, Luke tells us, to understand everything written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms to see how those texts were connected, how they were the key to making sense of all that had happened. And so Jesus does in resurrected life what he had done in, again in earthly life. Let me say that again. So Jesus does in resurrected life what he had done time and time again in earthly life. He connects the dots patiently teaching his disciples, gently guiding them in the way that leads to truth. And by his loving care and grace-filled presence, Jesus reminds them that his suffering, death, and resurrection was no random event, and neither was it a cosmic predestination. The rejection, the denial, the crucifixion was inevitable, predictable given the nature of human beings. This is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. 
And here's the key. Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. Yes, this is the Bible study that Jesus led on that night, writes Chad Myers. I know this is mind-boggling, but you've got to look to Israel's prophets to make sense of it all, Jesus said. The prophets are the ones who were forever holding the way things were in light of what they could and should be. The prophets are the ones who question authority, who make trouble, who refuse to settle, who interrupt business as usual, who speak truth to power, who give voice to the voiceless. The prophets are the ones who name injustice and protest inequity, who call out the police for murdering black and brown folk, who recognize the systemic issues that still exist with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who stand over and against denominational policies that discriminate against our LGBTQI plus siblings for being the inconvenient conscience of the nation and the church. They in turn get jailed or exiled or defrocked or killed. And the disciples like us understood enough to recognize that Jesus lived a prophet's life and died a prophet's death. He was sent by God to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. For that he came and for that he was killed. Yet suddenly here he was, the Messiah, standing with them in their wondering and questioning. Not the same person that Jesus had been, not some ethereal disembodied spirit, not dead, but alive. And slowly it began to sink in. This is for reals. This means that God has confirmed Jesus' way of doing things, especially that most difficult part about dying for the cause rather than killing for the cause. No wonder they were terrified and afraid. It was overwhelming to think that they were going to have to take Jesus' way really seriously now. That they would have to live so that justice could roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. They would have to love both their neighbor and their enemy. They would have to truly reconsider an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And they would have to rethink this whole business of repentance, revisit the reconciling possibilities of forgiveness. Look at his hands and feet, demands Luke. This is for real. God is not content to leave us with some sort of vague insinuation that Jesus was a good man who left behind some good advice. The resurrected Christ is not the product of the disciples' overactive imagination. Neither is he some spark of life ready to be absorbed back into the divine radiance. Such faith, woven only of gauzy whispery, wispiness, is sure to unravel when it's put to the test. Instead, the gospel declares Luke is tangible, earthy, and real. It's about hungry bellies and tortured bodies and people of faith running scared. And it speaks directly into our world that's caught up in a spiral of vitriol, locked down by enslaving addictions. The prophets tell us to defend the poor, but we're afraid to take the risk. Jesus tells us to draw wide circles of inclusion. Instead, we argue over who's fit to be in and who should be booted out. Here's the thing. The resurrection tells us that the only way to freedom and transformation is Jesus' way. The way of nonviolent, self-giving, creative love. Which is why Jesus ends his Bible study with the words, you are witnesses of these things. This is your new vocation, he declares in those six short words. You are witnesses of nonviolent, self-giving, creative love. 
And if truth be known, no one then and no one now really knows how to explain the resurrection. So the disciples long ago, and we in our own day, can only share stories of our personal experience of it. Where Christ's hands and feet are no longer physically present, our lives must continue to bear witness to the living, breathing hope of God, who loves nothing better than to bring the dead back to life. Maybe the risen one hasn't appeared in our midst asking for fish, but his presence is palpable in our soup kitchen and our food pantry. We experience the living Christ as we hand out snack bags, offer diapers, share our space with the recovery community. Yes, we can catch a glimpse of the resurrected one when we face our childhood traumas and come out on the other side. When we are reunited with one from whom we have been estranged for too long. When we take back our power from addiction. It's true. We will find the risen Lord planting vegetables, creating a refrigerator ministry, reading with children, committing time to study the scriptures together, waiting tables and washing feet, serving the customer and the citizen, touching the outcast, reaching for the lost, healing for broken, speaking graceful words of forgiveness and reconciliation, transformation, making all things new. As in the first century, so now. The most convincing proof of the resurrection is in our hands and feet, in our daily testimony that the Christ is alive and God's nonviolent, self giving, creative work continues through us. And as it turns out, we are witnesses of these things. Like you, I know that when we speak of resurrection, we're speaking about a profound mystery. Not for one moment do I claim to understand or to have a theological monopoly on interpreting the empty tomb. I, in fact, am still waiting for one of our fifth and sixth graders to provide a satisfactory answer. And until then, the only posture of a, that any of us can honestly assume in the face of such a remarkable story is a posture of humility. St. John's, we are Easter people called to be the body of Christ in the world, to be givers of second chances, to draw broad circles of grace, to be makers of peace. It's the way we give evidence of the risen one in our midst, testifying with our hands to the holy hunger for justice, with our feet to the divine struggle for peace, witnessing to the hope that we know to a vision of life in all of its fullness, and to the love of God, which never, ever dies. May it be so. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. And now we come to the time in worship where we have the opportunity to make our offerings. We might ask ourselves how it is that we share the good news of God's resurrection love by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. However we answer, may we answer with generosity, with compassion, and with hope.
And now let's go into the world to love God and serve our neighbor in all that we do. And may those for whom God's never-ending love is a stranger find in you generous friends. Go as witnesses and go in peace. Amen. Hello, St. John's. As you know, Bishop Bill McAlilly and the Nashville Area Cabinet of Tennessee and Memphis Conferences work prayerfully together to make missional appointments to every church in our annual conference. As chairperson of St. John's Staff Parish Relations Committee, I give thanks for the ministry of our pastors, Reverend Mimi White and Reverend Judy Hoffman, who continue to serve as servant leaders among us. And I am happy to share that they will be returning as our pastors for the 2021-22 conference year. As we all express our gratitude together, let me share this prayer on our behalf. Lord Jesus Christ, our living Savior, we give you thanks for our church. It is a gift of grace to us. We are deeply grateful for the leadership of Mimi and Judy, who will continue to serve us as pastors, teachers, leaders, and friends in Christ. May your grace be upon their families, giving peace and joy and confidence as we begin the new conference year together in July. Open our hearts and minds to receive the gifts you have for us in these days as we give thanks for what has been and anticipate what will be. Our life is in you, O God, and through the Holy Spirit, we pray this day. Amen. Hi, St. John's. John's. Hello, Pastor Mimi and Pastor Judy. I love you, and I am so glad that you're going to be serving us again this year.